production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. This time on Broad and High. A new public art sculpture coming to the hilltop this summer aims to reflect the rebirth of a community. We're making the hilltop better with public art. We decided that you know what went with hilltop rising was like a phoenix rising from the ashes. And an artist finds a clever way to get her books into the hands of readers. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi everyone, welcome to Broad and High. I'm your host, Kate Quickle. Two years ago, we brought you the story of Danielle Poling, who was commissioned to create an 80-foot mural in Westgate Park. It's part of the efforts of Summer Jam West, an organization dedicated to bringing public art to the hilltop. This year, the group wanted a sculpture that could symbolize the rebirth of this West Side neighborhood. Franklinton artist Andrew Lundberg took up that challenge. He's fabricating a phoenix, the mythological creature that rises from the proverbial ashes to represent the hilltop rising to new heights. Summer Jam West has a commitment to placing permanent public art on the hilltop. In 2018, our theme was Hilltop Rising, and uh, we decided that you know what went with Hilltop Rising was like a phoenix rising from the ashes. So it's all, it's all steel, um, it's all mild steel. All in all weight will probably be a little over 800 pounds. So we start with an armature and that, that's actually the most important part. And we bend and cut that steel into a shape that's like bones or a framework or an architecture. After that, it's a little more decorative because you're able to start placing things where you need them. You can cut exact shapes and you can really kind of figure out where you want to go from there. But it's all about the bones of it. The location that we selected was, is really meaningful and it's because it's in the highest area of the hilltop as well as it also used to be the old Delphi GM manufacturing plant. So this phoenix that's built out of uh, metal is reminiscent of these old car parts coming up out of the ground, you know, re renewing themselves. For the skin or the feathers, we use very small triangles, you know, welded a gazillion times all around it. But it, it looks soft, even though it's, it's really pointy and strong. And that would that was kind of a, a moment where we're like, okay, that's there's our there's our bird because we don't. The biggest thing was we wanted to stay away from Transformers world. We're using all metal, so metal can be cold, right? It can look somewhat evil. You know, there's there's a way in between. Either I'm going to look like a heavy rock metal band, or I'm going to look something in Transformers. But this is mythological, so we wanted to bring a story element to it, and that was all about the face in the shape of the head because there really wasn't a lot. It's not an open mouth, it's not a big expression. So it was really key in the eye to give it that kind of storybook, mythological, still somewhat friendly but fierce feel. When people think of the hilltop, they think of drugs, they think of homelessness, they think of poverty, they think of crime. And yeah, we have that up here. You know, no one's denying that we don't have that up here. But we're getting better, we're improving ourselves. We have an art gallery up here now, a fine art gallery up here. We're making the hilltop better with public art. It's because we think it enriches people's lives. I mean, this is these past few years have been the only time new art has been installed on the hilltop. And Summer Jam has got a purpose and a mission to bring that new art up here. You can learn more about the work of Andrew Lundberg at lundbergarts.com 
and keep an eye out for his new sculpture. It will be installed early this summer near Hollywood Casino. And mark your calendar for this year's Summer Jam West celebration. This free annual festival features food trucks, local bands, artist booths, and lots of kids' activities. It takes place on July 14th at Westgate Park in the Hilltop. Our next story features a Dayton artist who just so happens to be a graduate of my alma mater, DePaul University. Willis Bing Davis is well known for his distinctive artwork that pays tribute to his African American heritage and culture. This former educator says he stopped teaching art and instead started teaching people, using art as an agent of change in an effort to foster dialogue and build bridges in his community. Here's his story. I characterize the work I do as reflecting what I experience and see and, and what I feel about uh, being alive. I always thought that my work was a reflection of my whole experience of being. Almost saying that this is what I saw, this is what I felt, and this is how I expressed it. It's always all, my way of acknowledging that I was here. I learned early on that no matter what material, what process, or what technique I use, it's still coming from the same feeling and the same uh, reservoir of experience. My work is all speaking about the same thing, no matter what the material. At the core of it is the being a part of the human family and knowing that that also attaches me to every human being and that I am a product of everybody I've experienced and seen, that they've been a part of me. I'm happiest when I'm making art. I feel the most complete and the most human. I cannot remember a time that I did not make art. I made a, a public commitment that I was going to be an artist. In the fifth grade, when the teacher had me stand up uh, beside the, oh, everybody in the class, say what you're going to be when you grow up. And while I had been identified already by that time as being the next athletic star in my community, I knew it, it was art. I grew up in a small enclave of African Americans in East Dayton. I saw people who, who did art, who did dance, who did music, both at the church, community center, on, on the playground. My older siblings drew and painted and sung. My mother made quilts. So I had a nurturing environment, even though it was externally considered impoverished. It was only after I grew up that they told me that we were poor. But it was very rich to me that it was okay to be an artist. I had four years of art in high school, and the athletic director, Mr. Beekman at Wolfright High School in East Staten, was my art teacher. I chose to go to DePaul University in Greencastle, Indiana, and I took art there, and then came back and began my career in 59 and 60 to teach art in high school and go on to master's work at Miami and Indiana State and the School of Dayton Art Institute. I had a tremendous amount of knowledge about art in terms of the masters. So whether you're talking about French Impressions or Surrealism or Picasso, I had all that knowledge in my head, but no one had given me knowledge about me. And so I began to look around my hometown of Dayton, Ohio, I began to look at Native American art, Inuit art, Maya, Inca, straight and Aboriginal, then traditional African art. And what I found is that art wasn't just about paintings you hang on the wall that it was about spiritual, cultural, and social values of people and had always been there, and that the arts were interrelated, art, music, dance, drama, to reflect feeling. And that changed me. In 66, I said I stopped teaching art, I began to teach people. Art is my vehicle and tool, so how can I use art to help someone find who they are? and be the best they can be. And that has been my mantra ever since, to use arts as agents of change. As, as, as knowing oneself was what I found, that I could not only know myself, but I could also look at the art, music, dance, and drama and better understand someone who is different than I am, from a different culture. But I can just look at their art, look at their dance, and learn to appreciate it uh, as I appreciate my own. And that allowed me also to say that every student who came into my classroom or studio was the most important person in the room. They were already somebody. So what can I add to art to enrich who they already are? And if that happened, then they would be a more full person 
and then they too then would give back. They, they too would begin to share. They too would begin to realize the inclusiveness of all of us. And so that's just been the, the undercurrent drive. Give what you can, when you can, as long as you can. And then you hope that the person you give to will also give to others. I retired from the classroom in 1998. And one of my dreams was uh, to take my studio out of my house and get in a place where I could share it better in the community. We call it Ebony Gallery. On the nonprofit side, it's Shango, the Center for the Study of African Art and Culture. We happen to be in the right Dunbar Historical Business District. This significant neighborhood uh, is where Horrible and Wilbur Wright walk daily. This neighborhood is where the first international African American poet, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, lived and worked. I still feel the energy and I still feel that innovative spirit here. This is the 12th year for Visual Voices, and that's one of the highlights of our exhibition season here at Ebenezer Gallery. The Visual Voices show is at the Schuster Colson Performing Arts Center in downtown Dayton. So I wanted to do something with some of the African American arts in the community. I serve as a curator, and this year I selected the theme Black Life as subject matter. You can celebrate any part of the black experience, but I want to look at some of the things that are happening that we may be able to address in a personal way to contribute to the dialogue because we know the problems that we're confronting as a society aren't going to go away anytime soon. We may not have all the answers, but we can raise some questions that's worth discussing and considering. Much of the problems that we're having today are man-made with limited information and narrow biases. The arts touch us and unify us in a way that adds to our humanness because all societies, all cultures have always used music, dance, drama, creative writing through ceremonies and rituals to reflect what was of value and what was of beauty in their society. And so art then becomes a, a natural ally to human unification if we let it, if we let it. All right, so here's an artist who's making brilliant use of old vending machines. Printmaker and book artist Caitlin Warner has rehabbed a bunch of these devices that once doled out laundry detergent, snacks, or even condoms. Now, for just a couple of quarters, these machines will dispense one of her meticulously crafted handmade books. It's a project she calls Unvending. My training is in books. I love making books. It is really important to make things by hand, really start to finish. I think, you know, meticulously crafting things and really creating the experience and what you hand off to someone is important to me as an artist. I feel like I want to be very involved in every step or as much as I can be because I feel like when you work on something, you're putting yourself into it and you're putting you know, feeling into it, time and energy and emotion. And it's nice, it's a way for me to sort of give little gifts and, and bundles of hopefully kind of like happiness, pleasant little surprises to the world. With my work, I often find myself working as though I'm a, a one person assembly line. I really don't earn much money at it. It takes a lot of time and work. It's time intensive, it's exhausting, but I really do like the idea of spreading art quietly and insidiously just all over the place. That's the motivation for me to keep doing it. I just like putting it out there, but quietly, so that when people come upon it, it's more delightful. I began the Unvending project in 2012. It coincided with a residency I had at the High Point Center for Printmaking. I buy old, secondhand vending machines and I sort of clean them up, I make sure they work, 
I put new branding on it so they are now art vending machines instead of condom vending machines or snack vending machines or tampon vending machines or whatever they were in their former life. And then I make art to dispense out of them. And the art is often thematically related to the machine itself. This is one of my unvending machines. I call it the smut machine because it's a former condom vending machine like you would find in, say, a kind of a chintzy gas station or a, a bar maybe. And all the art that comes out of the smut machines has to do with love or romance or human sexuality or just anything. It's an opportunity to speak frankly, speak openly, be kind of silly and fun. And currently, is dispensing two different little books that are a facsimile of a series of text messages, a one-sided conversation from a person in love who isn't really responding to their advances and they get slowly crazier and crazier and a little more obsessive and desperate. Like most of my work, something that you can decide whether or not you take it seriously. It's either pretty funny, a little joke, a little one-liner, or it's kind of serious and deep. The Modest Manual for Living does seem to be just kind of a perennial favorite. It's one that is, on the one hand, sort of a little clever one-liner because on the inside, all of the pages just say inhale and exhale, which is all you really have to do to live. The term vending has some very commercial implications and it comes with this idea of, you know, profit and loss and margins and making sure you earn more money than you spend. And honestly, with this project, I am not earning more money than I spend. So it's really an uncapitalistic, unvending project. It is an art for art's sake sort of thing. Our final story today is one that merges art and science. It's a story about origami, which captures the interest of many scientists and mathematicians who help to demonstrate that when it comes to paper folding, there are infinite possibilities. of origami is now a very sophisticated global art form. It's no longer just a craft. Conceptual art pieces, abstract sculptures, installation works. There are master paper folders in many different countries. Sipo Mabona created this incredible piece here called The Plague, which consists of 144 locusts made out of US dollar bills. You see the sheets of uncut dollar bills that he started with transforming gradually into locusts that then jump up and start swarming the gallery. He told me when he was installing the piece that with origami there is always hope. I knew that there was a wide range of different types of origami out there, but I had no idea how wide the range was. There are artists in France who specialize in a type of paper folding called Le Camp and they crumple paper into all of these incredible organic forms. Another French artist, Eric Joiselle, folded paper and used water to wet the surface and he modeled incredible forms like the amazing pangolin that's featured in this exhibition out of a single sheet of paper. Miri Golan, an incredible artist in Israel, devotes her life to using origami to bring peace to Israel. One of the most wonderful aspects of origami is that it brings together art and science. Many of the artists who created the most incredible works of contemporary origami are also scientists. Some of the mathematicians whose work is featured in this exhibition create modular origami works. And modular works are basically formed out of many different pieces of paper that are folded individually and then assembled into a large polyhedron of some sort. Janine Mosley has a PhD in computer science from MIT and she has created many modular works using curved folds which are incredibly difficult to create. 
My involvement with origami is lifelong. I started folding when I was five. My mom got me my first origami book and I folded everything in it. Then later in high school and college, I started trying to design my own origami models. And after that, I worked for a long time writing geometric modeling algorithms and got back to doing origami again. And a lot of the math and programming that I did spilled over into the origami. A few years ago, some friends taught me an origami model, which is made with playing cards, business cards, index cards, whatever rectangular card stock you might have. This is uh, what people call modular origami because the origami is made from modules. They're all the same. And they hook together like this and they form a cube. And my son made a huge pile of them and I saw two of them sitting side by side and I looked at them and I said, oh my God, look, you can take the flap from this one and hook it under the two corners of the neighboring cube. And then you can take this flap and you can hook it under these two corners of, of that. And now you have two cubes linked together. And you can just keep adding them. And you can make anything you can imagine out of cubes. Art has been about more than just faithful reproductions of life. It's been about making things that are abstract and expressive and beautiful. And I think that modular origami is a really great way to do that kind of more modern art. A fractal is an object that is infinitely self-similar. And what that means is that if you look at a small portion of it, the detail that you see is similar to the whole object. And if you look at an even smaller detail, it's still similar to the whole object. So at every scale, the object resembles itself. And you can't actually realize a complete fractal. So a fractal is a purely theoretical concept, but there are lots of things in nature that are fractal-like. The way the trees grow, the way that ferns grow, the decorations on shells, the way lightning forks. There's quite a number of artists who either consciously or unconsciously have represented fractals in their work. The very famous example, for instance, is Hokusai. His really famous wave painting it has a big arc of the wave and then there are little waves within it and little tiny waves within it. And you can see the fractal structure in it. And when you actually put it next to diagrams of mathematical understanding of these structures, it's extraordinary how similar they are. It's ironic that mathematicians who'd been trained in another tradition actually were obscured from seeing this, but artists actually understood fractals long before mathematicians did. To me, this is a subject which reminds us that equations are not the only way to know the world, that artists have really actually been seeing profound structures in the world that, as it were, their scientific brethren were late to come at. I decided to make a large Menger sponge, and it took me about 10 years, and I made it out of 66,000 business cards and I had help from probably a couple of hundred volunteers. And I finally finished it in 2005. And then in 2006, I thought, what else can I make? <laughs> so I began exploring the space of these fractals built on cubes. And I wrote some software to design different fractals. And I came up with the thing that's behind me, which we're calling a snowflake sponge. Because if you look at it on a diagonal, it has a snowflake cross section. It's a project that's happening at the intersection of mathematics, art, and engineering. There's becoming a realization, and it's an emerging movement, that mathematics also can be a really interesting resource for artistic reflection. To my knowledge, there have been very, very few projects on this scale done. The USC libraries very much wanted to have an interdisciplinary project. And I think it was really brave of them to actually say, let's not do what everybody knows, you know, art and science. Let's do something really new. Let's engage with art and mathematics and engineering. Doing a project on this scale requires hundreds of people students from different disciplines who would, might never intersect with one another have intersected with each other through the making of this bizarre, odd, interdisciplinary object. One of the things that I think is beautiful about this project that resonates with what libraries do is that it's about building something physically. This is not a virtual project. 
One can make models of fractals with software, but you try physically making one, it's a huge order of complexity and it's a huge commitment of time. It reminds us that we're not and never will be a purely digital culture. I've always actually been interested in art. I took art classes in college even though I was a math major. I was always dismayed by the attitude of the math students toward the art students and vice versa. And I always wanted to try and bring them together and show them that they all had something to offer each other. So I really like the idea of bringing together different parts of a community to work on things like this. That's our show. You can check out all of our stories online at WOSU.org, or of course you can download our free WOSU public media mobile app. You can always find us on social. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're leaving you today with a special tune called Biker Boy by our very own resident rocker, Chuck Oney. He's behind the camera right now, and he's amazing. You can catch him live at the Bethel Road Pub on Friday, May 11th. For all of us here at WOSU, I'm Kate Quickle. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here next week. Tell me that you're still by my side. Tell that Michael boy that you really don't need a ride. Baby, don't you ride away. Don't ride away. Tell me that you're going to stay. Who believe this lies and the exit's going to buy okay. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you.